microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for December 7th, 2012. I'm Carl Estabrook. This is a special edition of News from Neptune, a program named in honor of Noam Chomsky, who is 84 today. Today is also the anniversary of the Japanese attack on the U.S. Navy uh, in Hawaii on December 7, 1941. The U.S. had stolen Hawaii fair and square a generation before, and the Navy, or a good bit of the Pacific Fleet, was there when the Japanese attacked on Sunday morning, 7th of December. 1941. In commemoration of both these events, Noam's birthday and Pearl Harbor, I uh, want to read tonight Noam's classic essay, uh, which was written as long ago as 1967, uh, on the backgrounds of the Pacific War. The essay is entitled The Revolutionary Pacifism of A.J. Musty on the Backgrounds of the Pacific War. And Noam begins, the title and subtitle of this essay may seem unrelated. Hence, a word of explanation may be useful. The essay was written for a memorial number of Liberation, a magazine of the 60s, which, as the editor expressed it, gathered together a series of articles that deal with some of the problems which, with which A.J. struggled. I think that Musty's revolutionary pacifism was and is a profoundly important doctrine, both in the political analysis and in the moral conviction that it, ex that it expresses. The circumstances of the anti-fascist war, and by that he means World War II, subjected it to the most severe of tests. Does it survive this test? When I began working on this article, I was not at all sure. I still feel quite ambivalent about the matter. There are several points that seem to me fairly clear, however. The American reaction to Japan's aggressiveness was, in a substantial measure, quite hypocritical. Worse still, there are very striking, quite distressing similarities between Japan's escapades and our own, both in character and in rationalization, with the fundamental difference that Japan's appeal to national interest, which was not totally without merit, becomes merely ludicrous when translated into a justification for American conquests in Asia. And here Chomsky is referring both to the Vietnamese War, and I think we can read it now today, also referring to American conquests in Southwest Asia, as well as Southeast Asia. This essay touches on all of these questions, on Musty's revolutionary pacifism and his interpretation of it in connection with the Second World War, on the backgrounds of Japan's imperial adventures, on the Western reaction and responsibility, and by implication on the relevance of these matters to the problems of contemporary imperialism in Asia. No doubt the essay would be more coherent were it limited to one or two of these themes. I'm sure that it would be more clear if it advocated a particular political line. After exploring these themes, I can suggest nothing more than the tentative, tentative remarks in the final paragraph. In a crucial essay written 40 years ago, and given that the essay I'm reading was written in 1967, that time would be 1927. In a crucial essay written 40 years ago, A.J. Musty explained the concept of revolutionary nonviolence that was the guiding principle of his extraordinary life. Quote, in a world built on violence, one must be a revolutionary before one can be a pacifist. There is a certain indolence in us, a wish not to be disturbed, which tempts us to think that when things are quiet, all is well. Subconsciously, we tend to give the preference to social peace, though it be only apparent, because our lives and possessions seem then secure. Actually, human beings acquiesce too easily in evil conditions. They rebel far too little and too seldom. There is nothing noble about acquiescence in a cramped life or mere submission to superior force. Close quote. Musty was insistent that pacifists get our thinking focused. Their foremost task is to denounce the violence on which the present system is based and all the evil, material and spiritual, this entails for the masses of people throughout the world. 
So long as we are not dealing honestly and adequately with this 90% of the problem, there is something ludicrous and perhaps hypocritical about our concern over the 10% of violence employed by the rebels against oppression. Never in American history have these thoughts been so tragically appropriate as today. And that last line is from Chomsky writing in 1967, but I think we can repeat it in 2012. The task of the revolutionary pacifist is spelled out more fully in the final paragraphs of A.J. Musty's essay. Quote, those who can bring themselves to renounce wealth, position, and power accruing from a social system based on violence and putting a premium on acquisitiveness and to identify themselves in some real fashion with the struggle of the masses towards the light may help in a measure, more doubtless by life than by words, to devise a more excellent way, a technique of social progress less crude, brutal, costly, and slow than humankind has yet evolved. Close quote. It is a remarkable tribute to A.J. Musty that his life's work can be measured by such standards as these. His essays are invariably thoughtful and provocative. His life, however, is an inspiration with hardly a parallel in 20th century America. Musty believed with Gandhi that unjust laws and practices survive because men obey them and conform to them. This they do out of fear. There are things they dread more than the continuance of the evil." Close quote. He enriched half a century of American history with a personal commitment to these simple truths. His efforts began at a time when, quote, men believed that a better human order, a classless and warless world, a socialist society, if you please, could be achieved. A time when the labor movement could be described as that remarkable combination of mass power, prophetic idealism, and utopian hope. Close quote. They continued through the general disillusionment of war and depression and any radical hysteria to the days when American sociologists could proclaim, quote, that the realization that escapes no one is that the egalitarian and socially mobile society which the free-floating intellectuals associated with the Marxist tradition have been, uh, uh, that the free-floating intellectuals associated with the Marxist tradition have been calling for during the last hundred years has finally emerged in the form of our cumbersome bureaucratic mass society and has in turn engulfed the heretics." Close quote. And Fanny, still not engulfed, he persisted in his refusal to be one of the obedient docile men who are the terror of our time to the moment when our egalitarian and socially mobile society, and I hope you hear the quotes, is facing a virtual rebellion from the lower depths Chomsky is referring here to, quote, the 60s, close quote, when young men are being faced every day with the questions posed at Nuremberg as their country devotes itself to enforcing the stability of the graveyard and the bulldozed village, and when the realization that escapes no one is that something is drastically wrong in American history. In one of his last published essays, Musty describes himself as, quote, an unrepentant unilateralist, on political as well as moral grounds, close quote. And the word has almost dropped out of our political, de uh, political dictionary. Unilateralist, as must have used it, meant um, uh, someone in favor of unilateral disarmament. In part, he bases his position on an absolute moral commitment that one may accept or reject, but that cannot be properly debated, not be profitably debated. In part, he defends it on grounds that seem to me not very persuasive a psychological principle that, quote, like produces like, kindness produces kindness, hence an appeal to the essential humanity of the enemy, close quote. It is very difficult to retain a faith in the essential humanity of the SS trooper or the commissar or the racist blinded with hate and fear, or for that matter, the insensate victim of a lifetime of anti-communist indoctrination. When the enemy is a remote technician programming B-52 raids or pacification, there is no possibility for a human confrontation, and the psychological basis for nonviolent tactics, whatever it may be, simply evaporates. A society that is capable of producing concepts like un-American and peacenik, of turning peace into a dirty word, has advanced a long way towards immunizing the individual against any human appeal. American society has reached the stage of near total immersion in ideology.
The commitment has vanished from consciousness. What else can a right-thinking person possibly believe? Americans are simply pragmatic, and they must bring others to this happy state. Thus, an official of the Agency for International Development can write, with no trace of irony, that our goal is to move nations, quote, from doctrinaire reliance on state enterprise to a pragmatic support of private initiative, close quote. And a headline in the New York Times can refer to Indian capitulation to American demands concerning the conditions of foreign investment as India's, quote, drift from socialism to pragmatism. With this narrowing of the range of the thinkable comes an inability to comprehend how the weak and dispossessed can resist our benevolent manipulation of their lives, an incapacity to react in human terms to the misery that we impose. The only useful way to evaluate the program of unilateral revolutionary pacifism is to consider what it implies in concrete historical circumstances. As a prescription for the United States in the mid-60s, it is much too easy to defend. There is no particular merit in being more reasonable than a lunatic. Correspondingly, almost any policy is more rational than one that accepts repeated risk of nuclear war, hence a near guarantee of nuclear war in the long run, a long run that is unlikely to be very long, given the risks that policymakers are willing to accept. Thus, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy was willing, according to Ted Sorensen's memoirs, to accept a probability of one-third to one-half of nuclear war in order to establish that the United States alone has the right to maintain missiles on the borders of a potential enemy. And who knows what probabilities the CIA is now providing to the Rostals and the Wheelers who are trying to save something from their Vietnam fiasco by bombing at the Chinese border. Remember, the essay was written in 1967. Unfortunately, the CIA is uh, in the same business today. Furthermore, it does not require an unusual political intelligence to urge worldwide de-escalation on the great power that by any objective standard is the most aggressive in the world as measured by the number of governments maintained by force or subverted by intrigue, by troops and bases on foreign soil, by willingness to use the most awesome killing machine in history to enforce its concept of world order. It would be more enlightening to consider the program of revolutionary pacifism in the context of a decade ago. And remember, a decade ago in terms of the essay would be the mid-1950s when international gangsterism was more widely distributed, with the British engaged in murderous repression in Kenya, the French fighting the last of their dirty colonial wars, and the Soviet Union consolidating its Eastern European empire with brutality and deceit. But as the international situation of December 1941, the date of Pearl Harbor, that provides the most severe test for Musti's doctrine. There's a great deal to be learned from a study of the events that led up to an armed attack by a competing imperialism on American possessions and the forces defending them, and even more from a consideration of the varying reactions to these events and their aftermath. If Musty's revolutionary pacifism is defensible as a general political program, then it must be defensible in these extreme circumstances. By arguing that it was, Musty isolated himself not only from any mass base, but also from all but a marginal fringe of American intellectuals. Writing in 1941, Musty saw the war as, quote, a conflict between two groups of powers for survival and domination. One set of powers, which includes Britain and the United States, and perhaps free France, controls some 70 percent of the Earth's resources and 30 million square miles of territory. The imperialistic status quo, thus to their advantage, was achieved by a series of wars, including the last one. He means the, what we call now the First World War. All they ask now is to be left at peace, and if so, they are disposed to make their rule mild though firm. On the other hand stands a group of powers, such as Germany, Italy, Hungary, Japan, controlling about 15% of the Earth's resources and 1 million square miles of territory, equally determined to alter the situation in their own favor, to impose their ideas of order, and armed to the teeth to do that 
even it me if it means plunging the whole world into war." Close quote. He foresaw that an Allied victory would yield a new American empire, incorporating a subservient Britain, that we shall be the next, that we, writes Busty, the United States, shall be the next nation to seek world domination. In other words, to do what we condemn Hitler for trying to do. In the disordered post-war world, we shall be told, he predicts, that our only safety lies in making or keeping ourselves impregnable. But that means being able to decide by preponderance of military might any international issue that may arise, which would put us in the position in which Hitler is trying to put Germany. In a later essay, Musty quotes this remark, The problem after a war is with the victor. He thinks he has just proved that war and violence pay. Who will now teach him a lesson? The prediction that the United States would emerge as the world-dominant power was political realism. To forecast that it would act accordingly, having achieved this status by force, was no less realistic. The tragedy might be averted, must he urged, by a serious attempt at peaceful reconciliation with no attempt to fasten sole war guilt on any nation, assurance to all peoples of equitable access to markets and essential materials, armament reduction, massive economic rehabilitation, and moves towards international federation. To the American ideologist of 1941, such a recommendation seemed as senseless as the proposal today that we support popular revolution. And at that moment, events and policy were taking a very different direction. Since nothing of the sort was ever attempted, one can only speculate as to the possible outcome of such a course. The accuracy of Musty's forecast unfortunately requires little comment. Furthermore, a plausible case can be made for his analysis of the then existing situation, a matter of more than academic interest in view of developments in Asia since that time. As I mentioned, the point of view that Musty expressed was a rather isolated one. To see how little the intellectual climate has changed, it's enough to consider the lengthy debate over the decision to drop the bomb. What has been at issue is the question whether this constituted the last act of World War II or the first phase of American post-war diplomacy, or whether it was justified as a means of bringing the war to a quick conclusion. Only rarely has the question been raised whether there was any justification for American victory in the Pacific War. And this issue, where faced at all, has been posed in the context of the Cold War. That is, was it wise to have removed a counterweight to growing Chinese power, soon to become communist power? A fairly typical view is probably that expressed by historian Louis Morton. Quote, in the late summer and autumn of 1945, the American people had every reason to rejoice. Germany and Japan had been defeated, and American troops victorious everywhere would soon be returning home. Unprecedented evil had been overcome by the greatest display of force ever marshaled in the cause of human freedom." Close quote. I remind you that you are listening in a special edition of News from Neptune to an essay written by Noam Chomsky in 1967 on the occasion today of Noam's 84th birthday and the 71st anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Chomsky continues, It is remarkable that such an attitude could be so blandly expressed and easily accepted. Is it true that in August 1945 the American people had every reason to rejoice? At the sight of a Japanese countryside devastated by conventional bombing in which tens of thousands of civilians had been massacred, not to speak of the horrifying toll of two atom bombs, the second being, so it appears, history's most abominable experiment, or at the news of a final gratuitous act of barbarism, trivial in the context of what had just taken place, a thousand-plane raid launched after the Japanese surrender had been announced, but technically before it was officially received. To Secretary of War Stimson, it seemed, quote, appalling that there had been no protest over the airstrikes we were conducting against Japan, 
which led to such extraordinarily heavy losses of life. He felt that there was something wrong with a country where no one questioned that. What then are we to say of a country that still, 20 years later, is incapable of facing the question of war guilt? That's Chomsky writing in 67 about the questions of 1945. It is not, of course, that the question of war guilt has gone out of fashion. No trip to Germany is complete even today without a ritual sigh and wringing of hands over the failure of the German people to face up to the sins of the Nazi era, or the German school text which glides so easily over the Nazi atrocities and the question of war guilt. This is a sure sign of the corruption of their nature. Just recently, a group of American liberal intellectuals gave their impressions of a tour of West Germany in the Atlantic Monthly. That was May 1967. None failed to raise the question of war guilt. One comments that, quote, however disparate our temperaments or our political emphases, we were plainly a group made coherent by our shared suspicions of Germany's capacity for political health. We had not forgotten, nor could we forget, that we were in the country which had been able to devise and implement Nazism." Close quote. The same commentator is impressed with the dignity and fortitude with which young Germans, quote, carry an emotional and moral burden unmatched in history. They have to live with the knowledge that their parent generation, and often their own parents, perpetrated the worst atrocities on the record of mankind. Close quote. Another, a fervent apologist for the American war in Vietnam, asks, quote, How does a human being come to terms with the fact that his father was a soulless murderer or an accomplice to soulless murder? Close quote. Several were offended by the way the camp, they were at Dachau, had been fixed up, prettified. Does the prettification of Hiroshima, or to take a closer analog, the prettification of Los Alamos, provoke the same response? To their credit, a few refer to Vietnam, but not once is a question raised even to be dismissed as to American conduct in the Second World War, or the emotional and moral burden carried by those whose parent generation stood by while two atom bombs were used against a beaten and virtually defenseless enemy. To free ourselves from the conformism and moral blindness that have become a national scandal, it is a good idea occasionally to read the measured reactions of conservative Asians to some of our own exploits. Consider, for example, the, wor the words of the Indian Justice Radhabinod Paul, the leading Asian voice at the Tokyo Tribunal that assessed the war guilt of the Japanese. In his carefully argued, and largely ignored, dissenting opinion to the decisions of the Tribunal, he has the following remarks to make. Quote, to Kaiser Wilhelm II was credited with a letter to the Austrian Kaiser, Franz Josef, in the early days of that war, he means the First World War, wherein he stated as follows, My soul is torn, but everything must be put to fire and sword. Men, women, and children, and old men must be slaughtered, and not a tree or a house be left standing. With these methods of terrorism, which are alone capable of affecting a people as degenerate as the French, the war will be over in two months, whereas if I admit consideration of humanity, it will be prolonged for years. In spite of my repugnance, I have therefore been obliged to choose the former system." Close quote. That's Kaiser Wilhelm, the leader of the Emperor of Germany, speaking on the eve of the First World War. And this is uh, the British, uh, sorry, the Indian journal, journalist, Let's have that again. The Indian jurist, Paul, writing to the Tokyo Tribunal at the end of the Second World War. He continues, This showed his ruthless policy, and his policy of indiscriminate murder to shorten the war was considered to be a crime. In the Pacific War, under our consideration, if there was anything approaching what is indicated in the above letter of the German emperor, it is the decision coming from the Allied powers to use the atom bomb. Future generations will judge this dire decision. History will say whether any outburst of popular sentiment against usage of such a weapon is irrational and only sentimental, and whether it has become legitimate by such indiscriminate slaughter 
to win the victory by breaking the will of the whole nation to continue to fight. We need not stop here to consider whether or not the atom bomb comes to force a more fundamental searching of the nature of warfare and of the legitimate means for the pursuit of military objectives. It would be sufficient for my present purpose to say that if any indiscriminate destruction of civilian life and property is still illegitimate in warfare, then in the Pacific War, this decision to use the atom bomb is the only near approach to the directives of the German Emperor during the First World War and of the Nazi leaders during the Second World War. Nothing like this could be traced to the credit of the present accused. And he refers there to the Japanese leaders uh, during the Second World War. Chomsky resumes, when we lament over the German conscience, we are demanding of them a display of self-hatred, a good thing, no doubt. But for us, the matter is infinitely more serious. It is not a matter of self-hatred regarding the sins of the past. Like the German Kaiser, we believe that everything must be put to fire and sword so that the war will be more quickly finished, and we act on this belief. Unlike the German Kaiser, our soul is not torn. We manage a relative calm as we continue today to write new chapters of history with the blood of the helpless and innocent. Remember, this is Chomsky writing about the use of the atom bomb. Uh, the, when the essay was written, no one has seen such things as uh, the drone war that the United States is conducting today. Returning to Musty's radical pacifism in the context of 1941, Recall that the first of his proposal was that there be no attempt, quote, to fasten soul war guilt on any nation, close quote. The second was that measures be taken to assure to all peoples equitable access to markets and essential materials. The immediate cause of the attack on Pearl Harbor was the recognition by the Japanese military that it was now or never. The Western powers controlled the raw materials on which their existence depended and these supplies were being choked off in retaliation for expansion on the mainland, that is in China, and association with Germany and Italy in the tripartite pact. Japan faced an American diplomatic offensive aimed at changing it, quote, from a hostile expansionist empire with great pride in its destiny and ambitious plans for its future to a peaceful, contented nation of merchants subcontracting with the United States to aid America's fight against Hitler." Close quote. That was the American position. Precisely what was achieved by the war if we replace Hitler by the international communist conspiracy. To understand the Japanese predicament more fully, to evaluate the claim that Japan represented the forces of unprecedented evil, arrayed against the American-led cause of human freedom, and to appreciate the substance of Musty's radical pacifist alternative, it is necessary to look with some care into the backgrounds of Japanese imperialism. And at this point in Noam Chomsky's essay on the backgrounds of the Pacific War, he launches on a detailed and careful uh, description of the backgrounds of Japanese imperialism as they developed from the end of the 19th century uh, down to the eve of the Second World War. That's a history that most Americans don't know. Uh, as far as we're concerned, the history of the Second World War begins with the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Uh, and it's important that we do know this if we're going to talk about the matter at all seriously. I have to shift, I have to skip this section uh, in the interest of time today in order to see uh, Chomsky's argument uh, as it expands on the significance of the backgrounds of the Pacific War to the political situation of American war in the 1960s uh, with the further suggestion that what Chomsky was writing in 1967 is remarkably prescient in regard to American war in the 21st century. Chomsky, after a careful review of the history, uh, uh, then turns to the condition of Japan uh, on the eve of the Second World War. The situation as of 1936 is summarized as follows. When an effort to set a quota on imports of bleached and colored cotton cloths failed, President Roosevelt finally took direct action. In May of 1936, he invoked the flexible provision of the tariff law, 
and ordered an average increase of 42 percent in the duty on the category, these categories of imports. By this date, Japan's cotton goods had begun to suffer from restrictive measures taken by more than half of their other markets. Japanese xenophobia was further stimulated as tariff barriers rose against Japanese goods, like earlier barriers, barriers against Japanese immigrants, and presented a convincing picture of Western encirclement. The most secure markets were those which Japan could control politically, an argument for future political expansion against an iron ring of tariffs." Close quote. It is hardly astonishing then that in 1937, Japan again began to expand the expense of China. The background of this argument is the view that the first half of the 20th century saw competition between the Japanese empire and the American empire for control of China. Uh, there's an eerie parallel in the conflict between the uh, northern elite and the southern elite uh, before the Civil War for control of the lands that had been taken from Mexico, uh, very roughly the Midwest. Um, this uh, competition between Japan and America for China uh, was called uh, the open door policy in American diplomacy before and after the First World War. And it was this that brought uh, the U.S. and Japan into, into conflict. It's hardly so astonishing then that in 1937 Japan again began to expand at the expense of China. From the Japanese point of view, the new government of North China in 1937 represented the intention of the Japanese to keep North China independent of Nanking and the interest of the Chinese opposed to colonization of the North by the dictatorial Kuomintang. Kuomintang was the nationalist party that had grown out of the, Jap out of the um, uh, Chinese Revolution of 1911. On December 22, 1938, Prince Konye of Japan made the following statement. Japan demands that China, in accordance with the principle of equality between the two countries, should recognize the freedom of residence and trade on the part of Japanese subjects in the interior of China, with a view to promoting the economic interests of both peoples, and that in the light of the historical and economic relations between the two nations, China should extend to Japan facilities for the development of China's natural resources, especially in the regions of North, North China and Inner Mongolia. Close quote. There were, there were to be no annexations, no indemnities. Thus a new order was to be established which would defend China and Japan against Western imperialism, unequal treaties, and extraterritoriality. Extraterritoriality meant, meant Western law ruling in parts of China. Its goal was not encirclement of Japan, but rather cooperation on Japanese terms, of course. Japan would provide capital and technical assistance. At the same time, it would succeed in freeing itself from dependence on the West for strategic raw materials. Japanese leaders repeatedly made clear that they intended no territorial aggrandizement. To use the contemporary idiom, they emphasized that their actions were not intended as a threat to China and that China knows that Japan does not want a wider war, although, of course, they would do everything they can to protect the men they have there. They were quite willing to negotiate with the recalcitrant Chinese authorities and even, thought, even sought third power intervention. Such Japanese leaders as Tojo and Matsuoka emphasized that no one surely could accuse Japan of seeking mere economic gain. In fact, she was spending more on the war in China than she could possibly gain in return. Japan was, quote, paying the price that leadership of Asia demands, they said, attempting to prevent Asia from becoming another Africa and to preserve China from communism, close quote. The latter was a particularly critical matter. Quote, the Japanese felt that the United Front and the Sino-Soviet Pact of 1937 were steps towards the destruction of nationalist China and the Bolshevization of East Asia. The Japanese were furthermore quite willing to withdraw their troops once the illegal acts of communists and other lawless elements were terminated and the safety and rights of Japanese and Korean residents in China guaranteed. Such terminology was drawn directly from the lexicon of Western diplomacy. 
For example, Secretary of State Kellogg had stated United States government policy as, quote, to require China to perform the obligations of a sovereign state in the protection of foreign citizens and their property. The Washington Treaty powers were prepared to consider the Chinese government proposal for the modification of existing treaties in measure as the Chinese authorities demonstrated their willingness and ability to fulfill their obligations and to assume their protection of foreign rights and interests now safeguarded by the exceptional provisions of those tre treaties and admonished China of the necessity of giving concrete evidence of its ability and willingness to enforce respect for the safety of foreign lives and property and to suppress disorders and any foreign agitations. The parallels, in other words, between what Japan was demanding in China and what the U.S. was demanding in China were remarkably close and they were a result of a generation-long competition for control of China already by the late 1930s. In 1940, Japan established a puppet government in Nanking under the leadership of Wang Qingwei, who had been a leading disciple of Sun Yat-sen, the leading of, leader of the Chinese Revolution in 1911, and through the 1930s a major figure in the Guomindang. Its attempt to establish order in China was vain, however, as the United Front continued to resist, in the Japanese view, solely because of outside assistance from the Western imperialist powers. Japan was bogged down in an unwinnable war on the Asian mainland, and it should be clear that Chomsky is throughout paralleling Japan's situation in China in the eve of the, the Second World War and America's situation in South Vietnam in terms of what the imperial powers said about what they were doing. The policy of crushing blow generous peace, the Japanese policy, was failing because of the foreign support for the local authority of Chiang Kai-shek, while Japan's real enemy, the Soviet Union, was expanding its economic and military power. How familiar it all sounds. You can replace those names with the names of the 1960s and the American war in Asia. With all of the talk about benevolence and generosity, it is doubtful that Japanese spokesmen ever surpassed the level of fatuity that characterizes much of American scholarship, which often seems mired in the rhetoric of a Fourth of July address. For example, Willard Tharp describes American policy in these terms, quote, we do not believe in exploitation, piracy, imperialism, or warmongering. In fact, we've used our wealth to help other countries and our military strength to defend the independence of small nations. Chomsky has a footnote here describing what the U.S. had actually done in regard to the Philippines as an example. Many similar remarks might be cited, but it is depressing to continue. A wave of revulsion swept through the world as the brutality of the Japanese attack on China became known. When notified of the attention of the Japanese government to bomb Nanking, the United States responded as follows, quote, The government is the opinion that any bombardment of an extensive zone containing a sizable population engaged in their peaceful pursuits is inadmissible and runs counter to the principles of law and humanity, close quote. He wished the United States had listened to that in the next generations. Now that these principles had been repealed, it's difficult to recapture the feeling of horror at the events themselves and of contempt for those who had perpetrated them. For an American today to describe these events in the manner they deserve would be the ultimate in hypocrisy. For this reason, I will say very little about them. In Manchuria, the Japanese conducted a fairly successful counterinsurgency operation beginning in 1931. The record is instructive. In 1932, the insurgents who menaced the people and obstructed the attainment of Wang Dao, the perfect way of the ancient kings, a kingly way, in other words, the way we use the word democracy, had at one point reached 300,000, but the earnest and brave efforts of various subjugating agencies headed by the Japanese army brought great results. This is exactly like the sort of reports we heard from Vietnam, right? Thus, the number of insurgents declined from 120,000 in 1933 to 50,000 in 1934, 40,000 in 1935, 30,000 in 1936, and 20,000 in 1937. As of September 1938, the number of insurgents is estimated at, of course, 10,000. Uh, as I say, parallel, I'm old enough to remember absolutely parallel statements coming from the American Army about Vietnam uh, in the 60s. Uh, the 
uh, next section of this article describes the pacification program and the strategic villages that Japan established throughout China, similar even to the language of what the U.S. was doing in Vietnam. Uh, we remember that the U.S. war in Vietnam was always against the people of South Vietnam because they didn't have the good sense to accept the government we picked out for them. That was exactly what the Japanese were doing in China. Uh, the Chinese, the Chinese in Manchuria, North China, didn't have the good sense to uh, stick with the government that the Japanese had put out for, picked out for them, and so Japan was reduced to doing the same sort of pacification programs that the Americans would do later in Vietnam. Uh, I'm going to skip the section once again. This I'm reading from uh, Noam Chomsky's classic essay on the backgrounds of the Pacific War. Uh, commemoration of the revolutionary pacifist A.J. Musty, which is found, by the way, in Ch a number of places, but in Chomsky's book, American Power and the New Mandarins. Uh, a new edition of that came out a couple of years ago, and as you perhaps can hear uh, this evening, the essay has lost none of its force in uh, 45 years of its existence. So events proceeded through the terrifying decade of the 1930s. Uh, my late friend Alex Coburn, uh, the father of our late friend uh, Alex Coburn, um, Claude Coburn wrote a book uh, called The Devil's Decade about the 30s, which is worth finding if you want the, this background history that, as I say, for most Americans has been wiped out by the Second World War. Seeking desperately for allies, Japan joined with Germany and Italy in the tripartite pact at a moment when Germany appeared invincible. With the termination of the Japanese-American Commercial Treaty in January 1940, Japan turned to other commercial channels, that is, to plans for occupation of French Indochina and the Dutch East Indies, and for gaining independence for the Philippines. The expiration of the treaty was the turning point that led many moderates towards support for the Axis powers, that is, Germany and Italy. In July 1940, the United States placed an embargo on aviation fuel, which Japan could obtain from no other source, and in September, a total embargo on scrap iron. These were, by the way, technically acts of war, uh, and were understood as such, of course, uh, across the world. This is July 1940, in other words, uh, 18 months before the attack in Pearl Harbor. Meanwhile, American aid to China was increasing. And aid to China here meant aid to the nationalist forces in China, uh, the, those who were uh, opposing uh, the Japanese attempt to establish uh, its co-prosperity sphere in North China. In September, the Tripartite Pact was signed, that is the alliance between Germany and Japan, and Japanese troops entered northern Indochina, uh, what we would later call North Vietnam. The goals were basically two to block the flow of supplies to Chiang Kai-shek, that is in China, and to take steps towards acquisition of petroleum from the Dutch East Indies. Throughout the 20th century and into the 21st, the control of world oil flows is at the heart of foreign policy of the industrialized countries. On July 2, 1941, a decision was made to move troops to southern into China, what we would later call South Vietnam. The decision was known to the American government since the Japanese diplomatic code had been broken. We were reading their mail, literally. On July 24, 1941, President Roosevelt informed the Japanese ambassador that if Japan would refrain from this step, that is, moving into South Vietnam and then there, from there into the Dutch East Indies in pursuit of oil, he would use his influence, President Roosevelt would use his influence to achieve the neutralization of Indochina. This message did not reach the Japanese Foreign Ministry until July 27th. On July 26, Japan announced publicly its plans to move troops to southern Indochina, South Vietnam, and the United States government ordered all Japanese assets in the United States to be frozen. Uh, and see that uh, same move by American governments in regard to Iraq before the American attack on Iraq and recently in, the, uh, in regard to Iran uh, before what looks like being a coming American attack on Iran. On August, August 1st, a total embargo of oil was announced by the United States, a total embargo of oil on Japan. 
At this point, Japan was denied access to all the vitally needed supplies outside her own control. What slender hope there now remained to avoid war lay in the whole Nomura attacks, uh, sorry, the whole Nomura talks. These were discussions between American and Japanese officials, which had been underway since February. The nature of these talks has been a matter of some dispute. Paul, the Indian jurist from the post-war tribunal, points out that the American position hardened noticeably in the course of the discussions with respect to all major issues. The United States insisted on making the Axis alliance a major issue, that is, the alliance between Japan and Germany, though Japan persistently de-emphasized it. Schrader argues here, and now here's the emergence, actually he's appeared before in the section of the essay I haven't read, of uh, Paul Schrader. Paul Schrader was for many years on the faculty of uh, the University of Illinois History Department and wrote a book in the late 1950s about the diplomacy of the United States before and after the Second World War. Schrader argues that the American motive uh, in these talks right before uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, was in part, quote, selling the anticipated war with Japan to the American people. That's crucial, it seems to me, that when we look back on this history, we find what was a commonplace to Paul Schrader, writing in 1958, uh, that what the Roosevelt administration was doing uh, in the run-up to Pearl Harbor was preparing uh, the American people for war because the major opposition to the U.S. getting involved in what was already a major war in Europe and in Asia, uh, the major opposition to that came from the American people. The biggest difficulty um, uh, Roosevelt had was the anti-war movement in the United States, and he had to find some way to manipulate around that to uh, make Japan strike the first blow, uh, as Lincoln, for example, had manipulated the Confederacy into striking the first blow in 1861. Uh, I don't have to go too much farther on that analogy, but it's a great tradition of American politics that an American government that wants to go to war has to deal with the fact that the American public rarely, if ever, wants to go to war and has to be tricked into it one way or another. Uh, it, that the Roosevelt administration did that with Pearl Harbor seems now uh, determined. The biggest problem that the Roosevelt government had was with the American people who, quote, might not agree that an attack on non-American soil on Thailand or Malaya or Singapore or the Netherlands East Indies constituted attack on the United States, close quote. You see, that wasn't enough to convince Americans that they should go to war. We need an attack on America. It may be that the underlying motive was to justify the forthcoming American involvement in the European war. Roosevelt, the Roosevelt administration was very much more interested in getting involved in the European war. In any event, the American terms by November were such that Japan would have had to abandon totally its attempt to secure special interests of the sort possessed by the United States and Britain in the areas under their domination, as well as its alliance with the Axis power, becoming a mere subcontractor in the emerging American world system. Japan chose war, as we now know, with no expectation of victory over the United States, but in the hope, quote, that the Americans, confronted by a German victory in Europe and weary of war in the Pacific, would agree to negotiated peace in which Japan would be recognized as the dominant power in Eastern Asia." Close quote. That was the Japanese view uh, at the time, just before Pearl Harbor. On November 7, 1941, in other words, just one month before the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan offered to accept the principle of non-discrimination in commercial relations in the Pacific, including China, if this principle were adopted throughout the world. Non-discrimination in commercial relations meant that equal, assets for, uh, equal ask access for all countries uh, throughout the Pacific region uh, and the reduction of the tariff burdens uh, that uh, dif differentiated between countries. The qualification was, needless to say, quite unthinkable, the idea that this should be worldwide. Hull's final demand, that's the American Secretary of State, was that the principle be applied in the Japanese-occupied areas and that Japan withdraw all forces from China and Indochina. <laughs> 
the Western powers could not be expected to respond in kind in their dominions. A few days later came the day that will live in infamy, as, the, as Franklin Roosevelt described the attack on Pearl Harbor. This final exchange points clearly to what had been for decades the central problem. Japan had insisted that in its plans for co-prosperity and then a new order, it was simply following the precedent established by Great Britain and the United States. It was establishing its own Monroe Doctrine and realizing its manifest destiny. It is revealing to study the American response to this claim. Hull professed to be shocked. In his view of the matter, the Monroe Doctrine, quote, as we interpret and apply it uniformly since 1823, only contemplate steps for our physical safety, whereas Japan is bent on aggression. He deplored the simplicity of mind that made it difficult for Japanese generals to see why the United States, on the one hand, should assert leadership in the Western Hemisphere with the Monroe Doctrine, and on the other, want to interfere with Japan's assuming leadership in Asia. And he asked Nomura, the Japanese official, why can't the Japanese government educate the generals to a more correct understanding of this fundamental distinction? American scholars were equally offended by the analogy, the analogy between what Japan wanted for East Asia and what America was doing with the Monroe Doctrine in 1823. W.W. Willoughby, in a detailed analysis, concludes that no comparison can be made between the Monroe Doctrine and Japan's plans. The United States, he asserts, has never resorted to the Monroe Doctrine to demand, quote, that it be given special commercial or other economic privileges in the other American countries. Rather, it has exercised its powers of military intervention or of financial administration for the benefit of the peoples of the countries concerned, the countries of Latin America, or of those who have had just pecuniary claims against them. I think that would refer to the fact that the uh, U.S. once sent a gunboat to collect money owned to one of the great American robber barons uh, from Latin America before the turn of the century in the Teddy Roosevelt administration. He cites with approval the discussion by G.H. Blakesley in Foreign Affairs, this is another American historian writing in, 19, in the 1960s, which characterizes the main difference between the American and Japanese position in this way, quote, you, you got to hear this to believe it, I mean, this is... <laughs> This is an American historian, and I, I have to say, you know, that for my sins, I spent a good deal of my uh, uh, wasted youth being educated by American historians, or that's what they said, and um, this is a good example. Quote, American historian writing in Foreign Affairs in the 1960s, the United States is a vast territory with a great population vis-a-vis a -vis a dozen Caribbean republics, each with a relatively small area and population. Japan, on the other hand, is a country with a relatively small area and population vis-a-vis -vis the vast territory and great population of China. An attitude which therefore appears natural for the United States to take towards the Caribbean states does not appear for natural for Japan to take towards China." Close quote. This contribution to the history of imperialist apologia at least has the merit of originality. To my knowledge, no one had previously argued that attempts by one nation to dominate another are proper to the extent that the victim is smaller and weaker than the power that is bent on subjugating it. However, this argument is perhaps surpassed in acuity by Blakesley's next explanation of the fundamental error in the Japanese analogy, quote, the United States does not need to use military force to induce the Caribbean republics to permit American capital to find profitable investment. The doors are voluntarily wide open." Close quote. American willingness to submit to the people's will in the Caribbean was in fact nicely illustrated in the fall of 1933, a few months after Blakesley's article appeared, when Raymond Grau San Martin came into power in Cuba with a program that interrupted what Sumner Wells described as the attempt to secure, quote, a practical monopoly on the Cuban market for American imports. As Wells noted, this government was highly prejudicial to our, that is the U.S., interest. Our own commercial and export interests cannot be revived under this government, that is the new Cuban government. Uh, this was not Castro, this was long before. 
Consequently, Roosevelt refused to recognize the Grau government, and Wells com commenced his intrigues, which he admitted were anomalous, with Batista, who was, in his judgment, the only individual in Cuba today who represented authority. This had rallied to his support the very great majority of his commercial and financial interests in Cuba who were looking for protection. This is Sumner Wells writing to the Secretary of State in 1933. The Grau government soon fell with the result that, quote, the pre-1930 social and economic class structure was retained and the important place in the human economy held by foreign enterprises, guess whose, was not fundamentally disturbed. But the basic inadequacy of the Japanese analogy is the difference in aims, according to this man, Blakesley. The United States, quote, aims to help the backward Caribbean countries to establish and maintain conditions of stability and prosperity. The United States does not wish to seize territory directly or indirectly or to assume political or economic control. And when it has seemed necessary to intervene in some revolution-tossed land, it has effected the necessary reorganization and is then withdrawn. Close quote. It is this benevolence of intent that the Japanese do not share. Consequently, their appeal to the precedent of American practice is entirely without worth. The matter is simply put, in a recent study of post-war American foreign policy, which is very critical of its recent directions, quote, the American empire came into being by accident and has been maintained from a sense of benevolence. We engaged in a kind of welfare imperialism, empire building for noble ends rather than for such base motives as profit and influence. We have not exploited our empire. Have we not been generous with our clients and allies, sending them vast amounts of money and even sacrificing the lives of our own soldiers on their behalf? Of course we have. Close quote. This is American scholarly writing from the 1960s, and unfortunately, it hasn't changed much. In comparison with this long-standing record of benevolence, Japanese aggression stands exposed as the kind of unprecedented evil that fully merited the atom bomb. This review obviously does not exhaust the issues, but it does serve, I think, to place in context the policy alternatives that were open to the United States in 1941 and in earlier years. The predominant American opinion remains that the only proper response was the one that was adopted. It contrasts realists of the George Kennan variety with the position expressed by Paul Schrader, who argues that the mistake of basing policy on an emphasis of meeting out justice rather than doing good, the moralistic position of Hull, the too hard and rigid policy with Japan, in Schrader's view, was not based on sinister design or warlike intent, but on sincere and uncompromising adherence to moral principles and liberal doctrines, close quote. The realistic approach of accommodation favored by uh, Kennan and others would not only have been immoral, he argues, it would have constituted only a recognition that the American was government was not then in a position to enforce its principles, reserving for America full freedom of action at some later, more favorable time, close quote. Schrader does not question that we were, in effect, meeting out justice, but argues only that we were wrong, overly moralistic, to do so. He does not question the principles to which the United States adhered, but only our insistence on abiding by these principles at an inappropriate time. This debate that's sketched here, perhaps obscurely, is the debate when, which went on uh, within the limits of allowable debate in regard to Vietnam. Uh, the question was, was the United States um, uh, overreaching itself uh, in an attempt to do good in Vietnam, that was the liberal position of American scholarship in Vietnam, or was the United States in fact doing what it had to do uh, for the good of all humanity? That was the conservative position in regard to Vietnam. We've heard those again in regard to Southwest Asia recently. In contrast to the alternatives of realism and moralism so defined, the revolutionary pacifism musty seems to me both relative, eminently realistic and highly moral. Furthermore, even if we were to grant the claim that the United States simply acted in legitimate self-defense, subsequent events in Asia have amply, hideously confirmed Musty's basic presence premise that the means one uses inevitably incorporate themselves into his ends, and if evil, will defeat him. 
Whether Musty's was in fact the most realistic and moral position at the time may be debated, but I think there is no doubt that its remoteness from the American consciousness was a great tragedy. The lack of a radical critique of the sort that Musty and a few others sought to develop was one of the factors that contributed to the atrocity of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as the weakness and ineffectiveness of such radical critique today will doubtless lead to new and unimaginable horrors. This is Carl Estabrook. We've been reading Noam Chomsky's classic essay on the backgrounds of the Pacific War for December 7th, 2012. Good night.